The Hudson Library and Historical Society presents an important and informative discussion on the heroin epidemic in Summit County with the presiding judge of the Court of Common Pleas in Summit County, the Honorable Judge Mary Margaret Rollins. An in-depth and thought-provoking look at the frightening revival of this deadly drug. Recorded at Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on October 29, 2014. Thank you for coming to the Hudson Library and Historical Society tonight. My name is Jody Delamater. I am a reference librarian upstairs. And in that role, uh, in July, I was organizing our, uh, at that time, annual Ohio Author Book Fair. And one of the authors we had attend during the uh, build-up week before the, the fair was a uh, Case Western Reserve University English professor, Michael, Michael Clue, C-L-U-N-E. And he wrote a memoir about his days when he was a grad student and he was a heroin addict. I originally just found him by trolling, looking for Ohio authors for our event. But I invited him here to speak. The title of his book is Whiteout, The Secret Life of Heroin. And it was a very moving presentation. It was just he and Kabir Bhatia speaking to one another. And it was, his book is, is quite astounding. He's, of course, lucky to be alive. Uh, the sad thing is, um, only, I think he said, less than 10% or something of heroin addicts can recover with all the money that we're trying to put into recovery programs. But at, after that uh, wonderful session and moving session, uh, somebody came up to me and said, this is a real issue. This is a very big issue here in Hudson and, of course, the whole country. So that's why I again went looking for a speaker, someone who actually was my neighbor at one time, um, and she is serving on the Summit County Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Board Opiate Task Force, and I thought, well, what better person to come to speak about this very serious issue than a very serious person who's on a very serious board. Um, so I thank you for coming and caring about this issue, and I'm going to let Mary Margaret Rowland Good evening, everyone. How are you? Actually, the other role that I have, my day job, I guess you'd say, is I'm a judge in the Summit County Court of Common Pleas. And Common Pleas Court is the court. We're downtown Akron in the courthouse with the Lions. If you've had jury duty, you may have come in and, and uh, come into the building. But our court, on the criminal side, we, we have um, civil cases you know, of, of all kinds of uh, issues, but they're about money. On the criminal side, we're responsible for all felony cases. And I w came on the bench in 2008. I was elected in 2008. And in the years that passed very quickly, it became apparent to me that a significant number of our cases revolved around heroin heroin addiction, heroin sales, heroin use, and gun violence that results from the sale of heroin. Um, the money that's involved is astronomical. Interestingly, heroin is, I've been practicing law since 1989, so 25 years, and in the 25 years I've been a lawyer and a judge, I can tell you that heroin is the first drug that unites this county from one end to the other. In the cities, in the urban areas of Akron particularly, uh, some parts of Cuyahoga Falls, Barberton, um, we see lots of gun violence and young people are dying al almost daily from gun violence over the sale of the drug. And then out in the suburbs, in places like Hudson and Sagamore Hills and Richfield, places that are historically have been very safe from crime, 
We are losing young people at the rate of one or two per week to heroin overdoses. So I came tonight, I've, I've kind of made it my mission to go around the county and talk to folks about heroin, ask people if you have questions, how is it that heroin, I mean, how did it come about? It just seems insane. It was, I, I vaguely remember some rock stars. I think maybe some of the Rolling Stones used heroin in the 60s. Uh, Kate Moss, who's a fashion model, used heroin, I think, many, many years ago. But Eric Clapton, I think, used heroin. But then it just went away. How is it that we have it back? And it is back like a roaring freight train. Roaring freight train. I think that Jody's uh, citation of the statistics that about 10% of heroin addicts can be, can stop using is true unless you factor in a new form of treatment which is called medication assisted treatment. So what they've done is they have looked at heroin addiction a lot like they look at diabetes. And they, everybody's heard of methadone. Methadone is an old drug that was used to help people uh, who were heroin addicts. But, um, and now we have some other drugs. The primary one is Suboxone. But it is something that people take maybe for the rest of their lives in order to be able to stop using heroin. Um, how did it start? How is it that this happened? Well, I, I, I know Jody has um, copies of some articles. The one from, um, that was in uh, Cleveland Magazine recently. I know you all read. We're in a library, so I'm not going to read anything to you from that article, but I would encourage you to read it when you get home. It's, in, it just, it's just a phenomenal story about this scourge in our, in our community. And it, it, as I said, it is everywhere. One of the um, other pieces that I use often is a story called The New Face of Heroin. And it's, it's about Vermont, a place in, and it was in Rolling Stone magazine. Vermont, you know, we don't think of Vermont as, as the drug capital of anything, but Vermont, in interesting ways, is a lot like Hudson. Historical, quaint, small towns, close neighborhoods, you know, strong American values, and yet the infiltration of heroin has been profound. So how did it, ha how did it start? It started back in the early 2000, 2001. And I'll give you an example from my own life. My children, my daughter is 31, my son is 34. Both of them went to Ohio University in Athens. And my son was in college. My son plays golf. Golf, life isn't worth living if you can't play golf as often as you like. And one day he called and said, Mom, my right shoulder hurts like crazy. I can't even swing a golf club. He said, I don't know what to do. Well, you know, I've been accused of being the kind of mom who often treats her kids like potted plants and says, oh, honey, you'll be okay. You know, you'll be, you'll be fine. You'll grow out of it. Well, I said, why don't you go to the health center and see what they say? I don't know. Maybe you tore your rotator cleft because he also plays frisbee golf, which is a lot rougher than golf with a golf club. And there's a lot of, you know, falling down on the ground and things like that. So he said, go to the health center and see what they say. He calls me back later and said, mom, they gave me Percocets. I said, what? Are you kidding me? These are college kids. College kids have always experimented with substances, whether it was alcohol or who knows what. But, you know, marijuana, it, they're in college. Are you kidding me? Percocet. Why would you need an opiate pain medication for a sore, sore shoulder? I said, flush it down the drain. Buy a big bottle of Advil. I'll send you an extra few bucks. And eat them all day long for a few months, see if you can get the inflammation to go down, because even though I'm not a doctor, I think I am, so I tell my kids what to do. So anyway, he did that, sure enough, over the course of a month, whatever, his golf game was back in full swing and he was fine. 
couple years go by, my daughter goes to Ohio University, and she is enjoying the time of her life, and very eerily, coincidentally, calls me and says, Mom, my knees hurt so bad. I, and if you've ever been to Ohio University, it's a gorgeous campus that you have to, it's all sprawling and green and beautiful, and you have to walk all over the place. She goes, I can't even walk. My knees hurt so bad. I, they hurt. Uh, really badly after I stay out late and I'm, da at da and I'm dancing. So I say, well, why don't you go home early and um, cut the dancing out? But, oh, no, we can't do that. So she said, I think there's something wrong with my knees. I better, I don't know what to do. She said, I think I'm going to go to the health center. My roommate said I should go. Okay, good. She calls me back. She says the exact same thing. Mom, they gave me Vicodin. She goes, that's what I got when I had my wisdom teeth out. That's the stuff that made me throw up. Ooh, what is wrong? Flush it down the toilet, buy some Advil, see what happens. I am proud to tell you my daughter lives in Chicago. She's 31 years old. She's a nurse. And she walks a couple miles to work every day, and her knees are fine. So anyway, it just started to trigger in my brain, what is going on? Well, what was going on was a proliferation of physicians prescribing opiate pain medication for all kinds of things. And one of the facts I think that's on one of those sheets are the number of prescriptions that are be, were being written. I don't know. What does it say, Jody? I don't have my sheet with me. Is it this one? Yes. So, you know, this sheet right here, by the numbers, the scope of the problem, this is some work from the Summit County Opiate Task Force. And it talks about the number of doses that were dispensed between April 1st of 2014 and June 30th of 2014. And the number of doses dispensed in Summit County was 9,303,221. That's 160 doses per patient. And it is 17, over 17 doses per capita of people in Summit County. So what we see, that is the equivalent of over 17 doses for every man, woman, and child living in Summit County. And it's only June, I mean April, May, and June, three months. So it started with this proliferation of the prescriptions of opiate pain medications. They are highly addictive. And then what happened was in 2001, after September 11th, the United States invaded Afghanistan. And in, there are two places in the world that poppies grow very well. One is in Mexico and the other one is in Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, there, are, there were two forces at war inside Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda, which we all know was responsible for um, the September 11th attacks on American soil, and the Taliban. The Taliban is a highly, highly religious um, Islamic uh, they're both Islamic extremists, but the Taliban is, is, is a highly religious arm of Islam. And the Taliban was preventing the, the poppy production. They were preventing the growing of poppies on religious grounds. And Al-Qaeda was encouraging it. So when the United States went in, one of the goals of President Bush was that we win the hearts and minds of the people in Afghanistan and show them the American way and show them that we, were, um, we should be welcome there. And so the United States began to turn a blind eye to growing poppies. And so you can look, if you Google it or you look on the internet, you'll see photographs of American soldiers, United States soldiers, walking down roads with fields of poppies. So now we doubled the source of heroin because before it had been kept down for the most part, and just coming up from Mexico. So when you double, you know, you don't need to go back to Economics 101 to know that when you double the supply, what happens to the price? It goes way down. So we have now all these people addicted in this 
community to prescription pain medication or in this country. And then when their physicians wisely realize that this isn't a good idea for them to be taking, they've, they've now been taking this prescription pain medication for a sore knee that comes from too much dancing if you're you know, a 20 year old uh, college kid, the, the physicians stop writing the prescriptions. And when that happens, the, kids are, the people are still addicted. So they have to go out and figure out how to get it. So most opiate pain medication addicts we're taking, say, five 30 milligram Percocets per day. Out on the street, a 30 milligram Percocet sells for about $30. So that's $150 a day habit. Now keep in mind, when we're talking about this addiction, we're talking about people who are like us, who have health insurance, who go to doctors, who have families that support that. Um, another big source of young people getting uh, pain medications are, are kids who are athletes. You get a lot of kids who are athletes in high school and they move on to college and it's a, it's a whole new game when you get to college athletics. It's, it's not the same sort of rough and tumble maybe. The, 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 it gets, the competition gets a lot higher and kids can get hurt. And they get hurt and then it takes them completely out of their entire world whether they're boys or girls, their, their worlds are built around sports, around playing soccer, football, basketball, track. And now they don't have touch, in, they're not in touch with their friends. They're not in touch with their support group, their social circle, their activities, the structure of their days. They're completely removed from that and they feel isolated and they get depressed. And that pain medication just, it's like bubble wrap. You know, it bubble wraps them up, and they don't feel so bad all the time. So these kids start getting, you know, emotionally down, and, and the whole thing comes together. Well, anyway, when they're out on the street trying to fill their habit, it's hard to come up with 150 bucks a day. I don't care who you are. So what you saw, what we saw what, and have seen is a an explosion of property crimes. Breaking and entering, people going in. Why do you think that there's so many places that you can sell your gold? Because it's in response to all kinds of people when they break in to your homes. They're going in, they're looking for jewelry. There was a period of time where they were looking for prescription pain medications, because then they'd sell those. But they're going in, they're looking for jewelry, and they can take it down. There's no more pawn shop. You know, you can't get it back from the pawn shop. They go straight to these cash for gold places, melt down your jewelry, and the most, some of the most sentimental and prized possessions you may have, you know, are gone in a flash. But they get the cash for it. Well, it's hard to keep up $150 a day. Even if you're stealing, it's, it's still tough to do it. And so, the heroin started to flow into this country at a, at a heretofore unknown rate. And the heroin is cheap. So a $150 a day prescription drug habit can probably be managed for about $40 a day worth of heroin. So people started turning to heroin in large numbers, bless you. And the heroin is ingested, it can be snorted, it can be smoked, it can be injected, um, and what, one of the ways that young people are, people are dying um, is because their families are recognizing their addiction and getting them treatment. And so again, w these are folks with insurance and, the, and means to be able to send their children or their family members to really expensive rehab places. The cheapest one I know of is about $30,000 for a month. I don't, and that's really cheap. Um, but up to $50,000 um, for the rehab. Kids go, the people go there, they get clean, they get sober, they come home, and they have every intention of remaining clean and sober. But life for an addict who's been wrapped in bubble wrap all for, for now maybe a couple years. 
when you take off the bubble wrap, the normal day-to-day -day bumps and bruises, the guy who cuts you off as you're trying to pull into that parking space at the mall, or you know, the, the guy at work who says something snarky to you, or your mom just doesn't feel supportive, that is like shards of glass on their psyches. And it hurts, and they're, they feel bad, so they, they use. Except what they do is they go out and they use at the level they were using before they went into rehab, and one of the problems then is that that tolerance isn't there, and they overdose. So heroin and, and prescription pain medication overdoses have now overtaken motor vehicle accidents as the leading cause of accidental death. That tells you something. There are 50, usually about 50,000 Americans who die every year in car crashes. And we've now, over, we've now surpassed that with opiate overdoses. Except, stop and think about it, that 50,000 number of people who die in car crashes is spread out from, the, from babies up until you know, 80, 90 year old people, right? It's spread across the population much wider. This is a much more concentrated group of people, generally from about 16, maybe till 45 is, is the, probably the primary bracket of age. So those deaths are occurring at, at a, just a monumentally higher rate in that group. And so one of my goals, you know, as a judge, I have two roles when it comes to the criminal work that I do. And it, it, one is to protect the community. And I take that very seriously. And, and there are lots of ways to protect the community. And one of them, obviously, is putting people in prison. When we put people in prison, we are safe from them for the period of time that they are in prison. The other way to protect the community, though, is to fix what's wrong with people. And if I feel that if I can fix what's wrong with them, then I can make our community safer in the long run and for a long period of time going forward into the future. So we always are walking a tightrope trying to protect the community and how to do that. But um, as a result of seeing so many difficult and tragic cases, this year I have had, I think I've had nine murder trials. Um, almost all of them, seven of them, were over heroin. The deaths were over heroin. Um, generally, they are drug dealers who kill other drug dealers. Um, I had one case where um, $10,000 worth of heroin was dropped off at a home to a dealer, um, and he was going to step on it. Step on it means mix it with something, thin it out, and he was going to be able to turn that around and sell it for upwards of $30,000. That's pretty quick, and he could sell it probably as quickly as he could get his hands on it. Well, with, with social media and everybody having everything on their phones, there, were a lot, there was a lot of chatter on the social media about this heroin delivery and the big money and all that kind of thing. And sure enough, some other guys come in and decide, well, we're going to take that. So there is a um, murder in the Chapel Hill area of Akron where four young people were executed in the basement of a townhouse. Um, and two, the two people who were charged with those uh, killings, uh, one has been tried and convicted and the other one has been tried and retried and was going to be retried again because of all kinds of problems. But um, we see that all the time. I can tell you about another source of the addiction, and it's from um, our veterans coming back from, from the war, from the wars. Uh, the VA has been very generous with its prescribing of these prescription pain medications. And a couple years ago, they came up with a new one called Opana. I didn't even know what Opana was. Um, but Opana is a very powerful, very powerful opiate pain med. And what happened was a young veteran home uh, was hooked on Opana. 
And he went into the um, bad neighborhood in Akron to buy $1,200 worth of Opana. He was going to buy it, and then he was going to sell it to all these veterans that he knows who are all addicted to prescription pain meds. Well, being a kid from, young person from the suburbs, he wasn't that schooled in you don't take $1,200 worth of cash into a bad neighborhood in Akron and come out with the cash or the drugs, and in this case, his life. So he, what he did was he went in once, he did a buy, and then he went back to do another one, and that time they were waiting for him, and he was killed. And it was such a tragedy. You know, here's someone who's served our country, gone to war, comes home, and is a terrible addict, and is killed, survives his military service, and comes back to home, and is killed in a drug deal. So those, for all these things that I've seen over the last six years, um, I, I decided to come out and start speaking to people, try to get people to become aware, think of, look at the uh, warning signs, think about people you may know, young people you may know, maybe not so young people, young people. Um, my stepson is a sophomore at Akron U. His roommate's mom just died of a heroin overdose. This is a woman with a college education from Oberlin College. You know, these are people who, she's, those, the kids are probably, what, 20? She's probably about maybe 45, something like that. Um, so we're seeing just all kinds of people become addicted and dying of it. So um, I, I, I want to thank Jody really for inviting me here to speak. Um, I feel like a little bit like, I don't know, a preacher on a, you know, moving from place to place to spread the, go, spread the word. But, uh, and unfortunately, my, my word isn't that good. I don't have the good word. Um, but there are unbelievable we're, we're, we're very blessed with resources to combat the problem here in Summit County. Problem with that is getting people to the resources, number one, and number two, the resources, the treatment just isn't, you know, it's not like fixing a broken ankle. It, it just is hard to fix. I went to a symposium that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court organized in Columbus with some other judges and a lot of other people this year. And, one of the things they had someone speak to us about was the psychology of and the uh, physiology of, a, of heroin addiction and opiate addiction. And he described it as this. Inside every human brain is the brain of every lesser animal. So if, if, if a very, you know, if an earthworm has a a teeny, teeny little brain that does, you know, tells it to crawl along. That brain has been expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded until we have a human brain. And human brains have, and I may, if there are scientists in this room and people that know more about anatomy than me, I apologize, but the gist of it is that we have these frontal lobes and no other animal has a frontal lobe. And that's where we do all of our reasoning where we say, should I pay $2.50 for this box of cereal or should I get the on sale box over here for $1.89 and you know, what's the price per ounce and that, that's the reasoning ports of our brain. I shouldn't steal from someone because it's wrong. I shouldn't steal from someone because I don't want someone to steal. I wouldn't want someone to steal from me. That's the part of our brain that we use when we're making all, all those human types of decisions. Well, the opiate addiction is actually buried very deep in, not in the frontal cortex or prefrontal cortex, but it's buried back in what this um, psych, psychiatrist, I guess, called the, our squirrel brain. It's the brain that a squirrel has. I see it, I want it. I eat, I need to eat, you know, I need to procreate, I need to hibernate, I need to do this, I need to do that. 
It doesn't think beyond that. So when I'm talking, the, the big breakthrough I had when I'm going to this seminar was that I realized I'm talking to these people charged with crimes who are addicts, and I'm talking to them from my prefrontal cortex. I'm saying, this is wrong. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting your family. You're, you're hurting your children. You're hurting our community. And I'm talking to him or her from that part of my brain. But their addiction is buried in their squirrel brain. And I saw a film of a... Um, of, 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 of rats. It was an experiment that they did. And the cage is probably about, I don't know, about this long. And at either end of the cage, they implanted a receptor, an electrode, into the brain of the rat. And the, when the rat would touch a pedal over here, it would get a shock that was, is akin to what you get from opiates this pleasure sensation place in your brain would get this, this little jolt of electricity. And when the rat would run back over to this pad and do it in the right order and hit that, it would get another one. These rats forewent food, water, and sex. Those are the three basic instincts of a rat. And all they did was run back and forth, back and forth, until they died. They physically exhausted them, they would fall asleep, they would get back up, and they would start doing it again. And they would go for days and days and days and not eat, not drink, not sleep, and they would die. And when we saw that, we began to understand something that most of us as judges had a hard time understanding, which is what makes people keep doing this self-destructive behavior? And then we started to understand it. So, I don't have the answers. I do have hope. Um, I do, um, I'm not going to give up, but um, something's bugging me. Um, so anyway, does anybody have any questions on anything I've told them? Yes. Well, I have a couple. Is meth the same as heroin? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. Methamphetamine is an amphetamine. It is a, it's speed. And methamphetamine is um, created from a, a bunch of household chemicals and then pseudoephedrine. And you use the you use parts of batteries, you use lye. It's nothing you would ever put in your body, but people put it in their body all the time. And they mix it together, they shake it up, and now they make it in pot bottles, um, uh, you know, soda, plastic soda bottles. They shake it up, they cook it, and you have to keep, it's very explosive. You have to keep releasing the, the cap a little bit to let some of the, the, the dangerous explosive stuff that builds up out. And you, um, you do it, it takes a little bit of time, and then it, it creates this like crystalline residue that, that you smoke. Well, what happens when all the, the, the prisoners are drug addicts? You send them away, what happens with their addiction in prison? Usually, often, I, I also run a reentry court where I supervise about 50 people who come home from prison early having shown really good behavior in prison. I, they were very highly supervised, and we try to get them you know, back into becoming very productive members of our community. Um, and the stories they tell me are that, Judge, you don't understand how hard it was for me to be good when I was in prison, how hard it was for me to get, to get my GED, because I'm a big GED fan, so if you get your GED, that's a way of showing me that you're, work, you're trying hard. But they come back and they talk to me about it and they say, you don't understand. There's, there's guys in there who are as addicted inside the walls as they are on the outside. So I don't really understand how that works exactly, but I know it's there. So it's tough. It's very tough. And uh, we have a hard time sorting it all out, you know? Yes. Well, Judge, I've been in this town for over 40 years. I'm going to go back to 1970 when our pastor or first congregational church uh, went after uh, and tried to do something about drug, basically kids drinking, okay? 
And if anyone's been around, we've been on the, on the law and order bit, we've been on the war on drugs. And now we have this experiment going on in two states, then uh, Colorado and Washington, about taxing the issue and getting it out. I'm thinking, is this, is this where we are going and we need to go to get it out in the open? Let the state tax the product and set up rehab units in order to do this because this is like reinventing, trying to reinvent the wheel and nothing. I, I just feel like we're going around a circle. Like you want to go around a circle like a rat in a, in a maze and you, the, the society does it and it's like how do we get out of this, this terrible dilemma that, that you're put in? Now I wouldn't want to be in your job based on what you're telling me. But it's just like I work with people in my when I, before I retired who I knew were horsing around with drugs. It was a recreational drug, you know. And everybody thought, well, not, not everybody, maybe 10 percent of the people I worked with were using it on the side as a recreational fun game, fun games thing. And I thought, well, if you want to wreck your life, you go ahead and run. I'm not going to join you in this process. I never turned anybody in. I turned a blind eye to it. And it was like, okay, now here I am, I'm listening to you again, or again, I'm hearing your story, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure where any of this has gone, except for the fact we're still dealing with the issue. It's coming over the border, we're paying for it. So let's get it on board, and let's tax the damn thing. There is certainly that thought, lots of places. I, too, am watching what's happening in Colorado and Washington with the open sale of marijuana because I don't get it. I don't know how it's going to work. One of the questions I, you know, you go, you, it's hard to get a job if, if you have young people in your lives who are looking for jobs. You have to drug test everywhere. Well, how do you drug test for a drug that you can use 10, 20 days ago on the weekend, feel the effects and then they pass, but it stays in your system for 30 days. How do you draw? I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work. Um, all I know is for guys who are on, folks who are on probation to me, I do struggle with them. I have to say, we're not Colorado and we're not Washington and we don't have medical marijuana like all these other states. So you have to stop smoking weed, okay? It's just against the law. So just don't do it. Um, but the difference that we see now, now I can tell you, in Summit County, marijuana has become also a source of homicides. In Barberton, there was a man and his two young teenage kids, barely in high school, who were shot and killed because he was selling marijuana. Some, some two guys came, allegedly. They haven't been tried yet. Uh, to buy the marijuana and something happened and the family was killed. So, you know, even, it's hard for me, I, I, you know, I graduated from high school in 1976 and, you know, I'm not, I'm not unfamiliar with people smoking marijuana, but I never thought of it before. I thought of it, I guess, as a more benign drug. I never thought it was a gateway drug. The research doesn't support that. But now I see it as a deadly drug in the sense that people are dying in the buying and selling of it. So I don't know what's going to happen. Sir? Uh, I can see the prisons holding the sellers of it, the producers of it, the transporters of it. But the users, it doesn't seem to me to make sense to lock up people and uh, have them on the state's dole. When that money could be used to really help them somehow to uh, overcome this. I know Judge Stormer was, uh, she kind of initiated some of this in some of the counties. She did. She started the reentry court that I now have after she went to the probate court. Wonderful person. But I'm wondering, is there anything being done to, to take the criminality out of the users and try to use that money that goes towards setting it away, you know, it's 
they call the state prisons the Department of Rehabilitation, but no rehabilitation goes on there. To, to use that money for rehabilitation as opposed to uh, housing them in a cage. We have. Things have changed since I've become a judge um, in that way. One is we, not, we have this program called Intervention in Lieu of Conviction. It's a diversion program. So it's generally for first offenders at the felony drug user level. You can't be trafficking. You have to have, be a user and be, it's a, with a possession case. And what you do is you go through one year of what I would call probation. You have to drop uh, urines and make sure they're clean and not use drugs and pay your fines and pay your costs and get on the straight and narrow. And if you do that, at the conclusion of that one year, the case is dismissed, your record is sealed, and there's no felony stigma attached to it in any way. So that's one program that we've expanded a lot. The second program is um, when Governor Kasich came to office, he took this idea of the financial side of prison costs very seriously and saw that the biggest number in the state budget goes to the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, the prisons. So the legislature got together and now if you are charged with a felony four or a felony five, those are the lower level felonies, I cannot send you to prison even if I, if you make me mad and I really want to, um, unless certain criteria are in place. I have to give you an opportunity at community corrections before, and it, then if you violate those sanctions, then I can ultimately send you to prison. If I try to send them to prison, they would just turn the bus right around and they'd come home. So that has been a, 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 an impetus for Summit County to expand its already bountiful resources, primarily through the work of Oriana House, Interval Brotherhood Home, those are places that have been long-standing. Oriana House has now been around for 35 years, I would say, um, working at trying to um, help s people who are um, abusing substances to stop. And, but even for them, it, I've watched it. They were totally unprepared for this heroin explosion. They just didn't know how do we fix someone who's a heroin addict. Because abstinence doesn't work. It doesn't work. Not, it's not like alcohol, where if you abstain, I'm a fan of AA. I think support groups are great and, and those kinds of things where you go and you, 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 you get that support when you, when you feel like you might drink or use again. Um, but there's something about this squirrel brain aspect of the opiate addiction that doesn't respond well to that. And so basically what they've done is they've gone to these medically assisted models where you take this medication basically as a as you would insulin. How long? Maybe forever. There really doesn't seem to be a period of time where they're comfortable um, stopping it. Um, now it depends. It depends maybe how, how ingrained your addiction is, how long it's gone on. Um, I, I think there's an element of personal character and strength uh, too that, that can come into play. Um, but there, there are lots of factors. One of the most shocking things to me, my daughter is a labor and delivery nurse and she worked at City Hospital in Akron for a year or so, a couple of years ago. And she would come in and say, Mom, I just can't even tell you how many of these moms are on Suboxone, meaning they're heroin addicts or opiate addicts. And they give them the Suboxone while they're pregnant because the Suboxone doesn't have a um, flow through to the baby so that the baby comes out addicted. And, and she was just telling me about the numbers of, of young girls and young women coming in, and they're, they're, they're all being treated by, with Suboxone. And, and it was shocking to me, you know. So you see it now, it's just, it's just filtering down into, 
she said she used to take, take these little babies and say, oh, little baby, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to send you home with these people because it wasn't going to a good place. So, and you know, the thing about Suboxone and these medically assisted um, treatment is that you don't get high, you know, and there are drugs that, some of the drugs, they block, so when you take Suboxone, if you were to try to take an opiate, it would just be blocked. You, there wouldn't be any feeling to it. So that doesn't really address the mental aspect. You know, it addresses the cravings and all that kind of thing, but not the psychological reasons people use drugs. Sir? You uh, mentioned something about marijuana not being a gateway drug. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that? Sure. I think that the research, you know, back when I was growing up, that was, that was the phrase that people used about marijuana, right? That it, it was a gateway drug, that it opened the door to hard drugs, harder drugs. I think that the research among the, the health community has been that that is not the case. That um, in, uh, it's no different than, um, than maybe alcohol is. If you drink, that doesn't mean you, you know, do cocaine. Now, what it does, what marijuana does, just like alcohol, is that it lowers your inhibitions and it doesn't give you good critical thinking skills. So you see people sometimes making really stupid decisions. You know, let's get in a car and drive, or, you know, they can be people get talked into things. Because when your inhibitions are dropped, your consequential thinking doesn't work very well. So, but it doesn't, the, the research doesn't support a necessary connection. Now, I would say that probably many of the people who um, use cocaine or use methamphetamine also smoke marijuana. But I think that there are large numbers of people who smoke marijuana that don't do anything else. But can your addiction to marijuana be as strong as you, the addiction to the opiate? Well, the, the, uh, the, the medical research shows that there is no physical addiction to marijuana. There can be a reliance on it in a, mental, in a mental way, which is a lot of people who have unhappiness in their lives, maybe they hate their job, maybe they're not happy at home in their marriage, or they're ha unhappy with their family, or, you know, they use marijuana and other drugs, drinking, um, to self-medicate and just sort of they don't feel better, it just dulls out everything, you know? And so um, when I talk to probation, got people who are on probation to me or people who've come back from prison and they come back and they have a dirty drug screen for marijuana, they'll say, Judge, you know, I, I just, I know I can't stop smoking weed. And they say, you know how you cure that? Just put down the weed. Like, just stop, okay? We all know that it's not, it's, it's not like, you don't have to go to rehab necessarily. Just put down the weed. That's my, that's my theory on it, whether I'm right or not. And they're like, yeah, I know, I know. You know, one of the interesting things is that when I do get people to stop smoking pot, they tell me things like, guess what I did this week, Judge? I woke my kids up for school instead of my kids waking me up. <laughs> And they're all excited about that. I went outside at 9 o'clock this morning, and I took a little walk. And then, Because one thing that marijuana does is I think it makes you a slug. And I don't know how people actually operate, you know, in the world on it. But they're all happy that they, they got their kids up like a real parent instead of uh, usually the kids coming in and saying, Hey, Dad, it's time to I got to go to school. So... Um, and I'm not any expert on all that stuff. Uh, and I also am a true believer. I was saying to Jody when we were walking through the library, I think that everything in life is relative. And sometimes I worry that because of the serious nature of so many of the things I see, that I tend to look maybe a blind eye to some of the things that I think are less dangerous, you know, because I can only focus so much energy in one, one spot. But what's happening with, prescript, with uh, physicians prescribing opiates? Well, I think the, 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 the FDA has really, really taken a hard look at this, and the American Medical Association has taken a hard look at this. And now there are, I believe, much more restrictive um, protocols for the prescription of them. Everybody here has heard of pill mills, right? There were places in Florida 
that you would go in, and I've seen video footage um, of the, the it, there, they'd be in like a little strip mall, and there'd be a sign for such and such a clinic, and you'd pull in, and the, the cars in the parking lot, Ohio was the number one user of these pill mills. You go down, they'd give you an MRI that you had to pay cash for, for a couple of hundred bucks, whether they actually give you one or not, I don't know. And then they'd find, you know, that old enemy arthritis or something in your back or in your shoulder or, you know, whatever, what we all have. And then they'd give you all these prescriptions. And those people were then generally coming back up home to Ohio and selling those on the street. Because, like I said, you know, then you use your insurance, <laughs> you get your $20 copay or $10 copay for some, some drugs, and you can sell those, that prescription for an awful lot of money. It pays for a lot of trips to Florida. And you could go from one to another, down the street to another to another, and because there wasn't any insurance trail, nobody knew what was going on. But do you think physicians, though, are more... Yes, very much so, very much so. I definitely do. I think they're, they're definitely thinking twice or three times or four times before they write prescriptions. Is there more accountability here in Summit County or not? Um, I, I think that, you know, physicians are... I think they, they're, they're, they're probably is. I'm not so familiar. I mean, I, my sense was that back in the early parts of 2000s, um, you know, doctors are so busy and they get so much of their information from the pharmaceutical reps who come in and say, well, this is what's, you know, this is the, 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 the best, newest, best thing, you know. Plus, you also have all these people who, who are online on WebMD or whatever thinking, I've got this and I saw this medic medicine on TV and that woman looked you know, she's my age, but she looked 20 years younger. I want that stuff. I don't know. You know, I think doctors have to fight really hard against this tide that was coming along. Well, Ohio has ORS reporting, so that they, it's all reported, but it's not the same in other states. A friend of mine is a pharmacist in um, St. Louis. They don't have ORS reporting. She said she's never dispensed more narcotics since, since she's moved to St. Louis. So Ohio has one advantage here, but you're right. They can just walk across the border some of the other states that don't um, have the ORS reporting where all this... And this ORS reporting, I know, helps people, helps medical uh, providers. So what we see is like a lot of people going to emergency rooms because their stomach hurt or, you know, they had a headache or their shoulder hurt. And I'm talking about people who are, I, I know about it because they're on probation to me. And so I find out that they are, you know, they're really pill shopping. Um, but what I talk to them about it, you know, again, I'm talking, my stomach hurts. You know, I, all the bones in the back of my neck are fused together. I was in a terrible car accident in 1986, broke my arm. I broke almost all the bone, my knee. This body feels like it's 125, and yet I get up every day. You know, I take some Advil. Um, we all have aches and pains and arthritis, but these addicts, when they feel, I mean, they're not bad people. They're not, they, they want to get better, most of them. Most of them want to be better, but they can't cope. And Judge Stormer's the one who taught me a lot about how addiction affects people and the, this bubble wrap theory that they, they cannot handle the normal bumps and bruises of life and, you know, life in America, which isn't all that bumpy and bruisy if you travel outside of the United States and go to some of the parts of the world that have, you know, don't have good roads and don't have clean water and things like that. So, um, I've, but I've, since she told me about it, I've watched it and I see it happen. So, you know, for example, there are the kinds of things that um, you just wouldn't imagine. You might come home and be just ticked off and, you know, sit you know, put your purse down and say, I can't believe that guy at the grocery store, you know, put went in front of me at the line, he just cut in line. Yeah, well, it's, okay, you know, get over, get over it. 
that's the kind of thing that'll make somebody go into their room and just stew and stew and stew and think, oh, I'm going to use. Do you think there's any relationship between advertising the drugs? At one point, the drug companies could not advertise, and it's like, and once they were, well, once they were open to it, uh, everybody was just inundated. Would all American men know about Viagra and Cialis if we didn't have commercials on every sports program? You know, every guy in this room wants to be that guy in that ad. I mean, right? I mean, seriously, this is America. This is where. This is about you know consumerism, and we gotta we've gotta consume. Well, let's go to our politicians and say stop this. this <laughs> I don't know because I don't remember ever seeing opiate medications be part of that advertising. I don't think we've gone that, we went that far. So I don't see it in terms of a connection with here. I, if you were asking my personal opinion, I could live without seeing all that because, you know, then you listen to the part at the end where it tells you, you know, that it's going to, you know, you're going to grow three heads and you're going to have a horrible life and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So. Yes. I have a question. Why can't we stop these drugs from coming into our country? Why? I don't know. I don't know. I have been told that our great government does not want to stop it. Well, I can tell you that that is, there are more people that believe that than just you or that the person who told you that. Um, there has been some supposition out there I would suppose about that. I do know that for example you know even since uh, September 11th and we have all this security you know we can't get on an airplane right without you know virtually disrobing um, but that the container ships are for the most part go uninspected the contents of those containers and I would suggest that drugs come in you know, and I don't know that that's because the government wants drugs to come right, in, right. but there's, you know, limited resources and what can we do? I don't know the answers to that, but I do, I have heard people much smarter and more aware of how things work than me talk about container ships being significant vehicles for all kinds of stuff that comes. And that needs to be solved. Well, because we got the resources, we just need to put those resources well, we to work. We have the money. If we have too much money going elsewhere, let's spend it here right. protecting our own citizens. Right. You know, we got dogs that can smell it. We do. You know, there's all kinds of ways we can do it. I think that's, I shouldn't, we can stop it if we want to. But it's interesting because it's, go, it, drugs, you know, have come up typically from South America. Both marijuana started all in Mexico. Um, I can't remember when I was in college there was some kind of marijuana, I don't know, Tijuana gold or some, some kind of thing, but it came from Mexico. Cocaine throughout the 80s all came from Peru and from South America in the Andes Mountains. So all the cocaine came from, from there. Uh, so it's gone on for generations now through administrations of both political parties and so it's a confusing thing to me. Sir, you had a question. You, did the courts see heroin addiction as a disease or as a bad choice? Or I think we have come to believe, uh, we have come to believe that it is a disease. Um, I think that everything is a choice you know, the first time you use heroin or the first time, it, it is, there is a combination of things, but we in some county across the board, regardless of our political uh, persuasion, our philosophical persuasions, we have decided uh, to adopt the method that the Chief Justice is, is su supporting with us, and that is uh, treatment where it's possible and, and treating it as a public health concern that has some really bad consequences in to the rest of us so you know I don't use heroin or I don't use drugs but yet it's my house that's going to be broken into you know that's the ripple effect that we see so there is a common there's a criminality and then there's this public health concern that come together and trying to separate those out and sort those out are really um, 
those are difficult because I'll tell you what, if it's your house that's been broken into, you want that person to suffer the strongest consequence. I, what, 20 some years ago, I was in a trial. I, as a lawyer, I was trying a case and I called home at my 10 o'clock morning break. I called, I called my office and my secretary, I said, anything going on? She goes, well, yes. Uh, your cleaning lady called and your I lived across the street from Jody and your house is broken into. I said, what? Oh my gosh. She said, well, she's taking care of it. They've called the police, this, that, the other thing. I hung up the phone. I went in and said to the judge that I was trying this case with, my house just got broken into. I want these people, if they get caught, I want them to get the death penalty. <laughs> he goes, Mary Margaret, you're a lawyer. You know, we don't give the death penalty in this country for breaking into people's houses. But you know what I was the most mad about? Okay, so they took my TV and I had insurance and you get the, you know, I actually got a little better, nicer TV. Um, you know, and my house was all, potted plants were knocked over and all this stuff. But the thing I was really the most mad about was these people were in my house and they were looking at my photographs. They touched my nightgowns or something, you know? And I was so annoyed. And that's what I wanted them punished for was how dare you come into my home and look at pictures of my children you know, that kind of thing. So I, I have a lot of empathy for people who are victims of crime like that. Um, and yet I see things, you know, I also see things. I had a case a couple of years ago that was very hard for me. This, yeah, this guy, probably about 40, 40 some years old, his, um, he'd lost his job. He'd had a good job and he lived up north here in the county in a very nice part of town, or part of the county. And he had high school, young high school aged kids, and he had been his kid's track coach. But he lost his job, he lost his identity. I think he might have gotten hurt, but he started on prescription drugs, ended up going to heroin, and became a heroin addict. And he took the starter pistol from his kid's track meets and, that he had, and he went to a Mark's and he carjacked a lady who was, I think she was 72 at the time. And he didn't really hurt her too bad physically, but it, it was so awful. And she had her son who had developmental disabilities who had just come home from the hospital in the passenger seat of the car. So when this guy attacked his mother, he you know, became so distraught and it was just this awful thing. And my mom, well, my mom's 80 now, but she was about, you know, she's when she was in her 70s. And my mom is, she's just the queen of bopping everywhere. I mean, I could just see my mom at Mark's, you know, and bopping into the store and go in here and go in there. And if that, you know, and when these people talk to me about what had happened, the mom had become fearful hesitant to go out. You know, it just really destroyed her quality of life as a retired person. My mom would tell you, you know, she's, she's young. She's got lots of stuff to do yet, you know, and she's got lots of places to go. And I thought about my mother and it was so hard. And, um, and, and yet this guy was a heroin addict. And, and in his right mind, he would have never done these things. And his family, his wife, his siblings, they came in and talked to me. And he did go to prison for a substantial amount of time just because the consequences of, on his victim were so significant. And, and then he came out and I... Um, that's a reading on it. Isn't Suboxone harmful to the body? I, I, I don't like Suboxone. I, 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 it's yeah. not unharmful. So my question really, what are the pharmaceutical companies doing to um, create remedies that aren't harmful? That is so above my pay grade, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Sir, back in the back, are you going to ask another question? Yes, Suboxone doesn't always work, it doesn't always have good results. And one of the things I think is important, there's a stigma with addiction and a lot of people think it's just a bad choice. But if you don't try to rehabilitate the addict, there's more 
chance that they will become a career criminal. Yeah. That's not to say they won't wind up in prison anyway. But if you don't try to rehabilitate them, that's what will happen. That's true. That's true. And, and they become lost members of society. And so many of the young people in the attics we see are people who, they're our future. You know, these aren't people who were born without, you know, I always, I often say, I see, we always boil everything down to two things, don't we? On the one hand and on the other hand, right? Well, life isn't really that simple. But I often say that I see two kinds of people. I see people who were doomed from the moment of their conception, okay? I mean that. They were doomed. Their mother's a drug addict or, you know, they're, they're, they're just born into such abject generational poverty that if anyone even survives that intact, it, it, it's, un, it's almost unbelievable. And then I see people who are born with all the benefits that the universe can bestow upon a person. And those are often the heroin addicts that we see. And these are, these are our future. This is, these are the people who are our future. And I think that they deserve our time, our attention, our, our time, our t treasure, and our talents to, to do what you're saying, is, which is to give them that chance. And so one of the things, a lot of, when I talk to people, sometimes they ask me about, you know, are there warning signs? What should I be looking for? Those kinds of things. You know, and I would say that if you know young people who are um, getting a prescription pain medication for an injury, be careful, you know, be like me. Tell them to throw it in the garbage and get some Advil. I don't know. I mean, that's, I, I'm not a doctor, and I shouldn't say that. But, you know, um, maybe they're, you know, if you take enough Tylenol or enough Advil, you can hurt your liver. But uh, I, I, I'm yet to be, know anyone who became addicted to some Advil. And buy the cheap stuff at Mark's. I, not that I'm selling, not that I'm... Just lately, too, a lot of the drugs have become C2s, so that they, get, they can't be renewed with refills. And it's going to be a lot harder for pe people to, to have like large amounts of medication, so that might help. It can help, although I can tell you that we worry because sometimes people get addicted, and then when that medication is cut off by a third party, uh, their doctor, they get sick, they get desperate, you know, and, and they may not even recognize they're addicted until they don't have it anymore. You know, they don't have it available. Um, they, uh, I've often heard some people talk, there used to be a drug, I don't hear about it too much anymore, but it's Xanax and it's an anti-anxiety drug. And I knew some women who were prescribed Xanax. They had, had a panic attack and they were getting Xanax. They were, they were, the prescription was you took one three times a day. I was like, wow, that's a lot. But then when they tried to wean themselves off of it, they called it their American Express drug. They couldn't leave home without it. It was just the idea that if it wasn't in their purse, it could throw them into a panic attack. So the addiction was actually not only somewhat physical, but it was also emotional or mental or psychological, I guess would be a better word. And, and literally, I would be, and these were women who, you know, were moms like me, and some of them were lawyers, and some of them were, you know, bookkeepers, and, and we were all just middle-class Americans. And there was a group of women, and it would have been probably in the early, in the 90s, and their doctors were prescribing uh, this Xanax, and they said, then they and you would be someplace, and they'd say, oh, oh my gosh, I have to go home. You know, I left my Xanax at home. Why are you feeling bad? No, but I have to have it. And it was uh, it was a, a very eye-opening thing to me to watch that. We don't see Xanax too much anymore. I, at least I don't know if it's out there. I have a quick question. Let's say a person does go to prison because of a criminal act or whatever, they come out, they don't have a chance. It's very difficult. It's very difficult, which is one of the reasons that I um, asked Judge Stormer to um, step on to her reentry court. Because what we do is we have in Summit County some really good resources available for people who are coming home from prison. And that is, um, we have a lot of employers, interestingly. If I, if you, if I let you out of prison early, then you are on supervision to me. 
and you have to answer to me. So, but if you do your entire prison sentence, and a lot of times victims of crime are very angry with me when I let their offender out early because they want that guy to, or person to stay in prison. But if they do their whole sentence, they walk out of prison and they just go home. Nobody watches over them. So I think that I'm doing a better service to the county by making them be under supervision. And I have, the, there are significant numbers of employers who love this because not only is that person going to get in trouble by losing their job if they don't come to work or they use drugs or they do anything wrong, but then they're, gonna, they're, they're answering to me and the remedy is they go back to prison. So we do have some, there, there are lots of employers. Lot, they don't like to advertise, but you know, there are lots of employers who um, are very supportive of the work we're doing with people coming back. Um, not enough, you know, um, and, it, and, it's, and what also happened is as the economy tightened and constricted, you know, I don't need to hire you because you have a felony conviction. I can hire, you know, one of 40 people from here to that wall waiting in line for this job that pays, you know, eight bucks an hour. Whereas when the economy was booming, there were never enough good employees and they, the employers would take a risk, but then they didn't need to. So it did become a spiraling thing and that's where you talk about, you know, just a lifetime lost. But it's encouraging to me and probably everybody else here that you're taking this stand to help uh, people uh, avoid prison and when they get out of prison, to help them find the security success. Because I think the problem, at least I read about this recidivism, you know, they get out, they can't get a job, their only alternative is to go back into some criminal activity. Selling drugs, lots of money in it, lots of risk, but lots of money, and that's the problem. So the issue always has been recently in the news anyway that discrimination on the bench toward people of color send more people of color to the prisons than, than us who look unlike. Mm -hmm. Has that changed? I think that you, if you took a look at the prison population in Ohio, you would see an in an a disproportionate number of people of color in prison. When I say disproportionate, I mean disproportionate to um, the representation in the community. And that is absolutely true. Um, but you know, often people of color are also socioeconomically on the lower end of the scale. And so the, 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 the socioeconomically disadvantaged people are often the first to get laid off from their jobs, you know, to find themselves unable to make a car payment or, you know, and, and so I don't know that I would not say that since I've been a judge, I'm aware of any of my colleagues who have discriminated um, in a race-based fashion. I think there is sometimes a discrimination ba in a, in a socioeconomic fashion because it's hard to send a young person to prison with two parents standing on either side of him or her who look just like you. You know, you feel like they're trying to do everything they can to help their kid. And then you've got another kid who's poor standing there with nobody. And I work overtime to try to make sure that everybody gets the same kind of opportunity when, when you know, once you're already in trouble. Do they get legal representation? That's the I am going to tell you. We most, most of us can pay for it. Right. They can't pay for but legal. They can't, they can't. But you know what? Summit County is incredible. We do not, we have a public defender's office, but they only work at the municipal court level for misdemeanors. So when you have a felony in Summit County, if you are unable to pay for a lawyer, you are appointed a lawyer, and the lawyer comes from the pool, the entire pool of Summit County lawyers who sign up to be part of that pool. 
So the lawyers whose names you read about in the newspaper, you know, these, these stellar people who de de dedicated their careers to representing people charged with crime, they're as likely to be assigned to a defendant as, as you know, the new, newer guy or girl out of law school. And we often will say, well, didn't Mr. Smith, defendant Smith, hit the appointed counsel lottery with, you know, Walter Madison or Don Malarsic or, you know, there are, there are scores of great lawyers in this county. And they give of their time because the, the, the money they make, they make $575 to handle an entire case. And that is the cap on what they can make. Now, these are people who in the real world, in their regular practices, charge two, three hundred dollars an hour. There are lawyers in Cleveland that charge five hundred dollars an hour. These folks make five hundred and seventy-five dollars. If they have a trial, which could be months of work, $1,250, we really give them a lot of money, $1,250. Um, and so when I was practicing, I took appointed cases a little bit. And at the time, I wasn't charging a lot of money in my practice. And I charged $100 an hour. And I took a case all the way through trial. My client was acquitted, uh, found not guilty. Um, and at the end conclusion, I submitted my fee application. I got my $1,250. But I had kept my time, because lawyers keep track of their time. We know what time it is within six minutes, because we, <laughs> we bill in tenths of an hour. But it doesn't matter where we are. We always know what time it is. But um, I had kept track of my time. And my time came to, at $100 an hour, 12500 dollars So I have every reason to believe that that proportion is still the same. So I am so proud of our legal community um, for the commitment that they've given to the to that and they do it lawyers do it for all kinds of reasons they do it because it's it gets it, it's a way to get you know business and you meet people and, and you get to handle different types of cases and things like that so it's there's some there's some benefit in it for them as well or they wouldn't do it I'm sure because not we're not always that altruistic you know <laughs> But uh, you know, it gets their name in the paper, say, or whatever, and then they get more clients. So, how are we doing, Jody? With time, I saw somebody had to. You know. I know. No, I'm. I'm a judge now. I I I I know. I know. No more. It's on your time. You know, I, I say, I, I, let me just make one last pitch, and it, it's not about hair, and it's about, you know, you said you wouldn't want to do my job. I'm going to tell you something. I love my job. I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. There is as difficult, and I don't sleep well a lot, but ev there is never a day that doesn't go by that something very positive doesn't happen. And often it is some young person who's come in or whose parent has come in and shown me a picture of, you know, this is my kid graduating from college. Or I've had people come in, women come in, bring their little children and say, this is the lady that sent me to prison. She saved my life. <laughs> and I mean, you, where do you get to do that? I mean, it's amazing. I don't get to do that. I know. <laughs> well, you have defibrillators here. You might be able to actually really <laughs> save someone's life. But we, we do, I love my job, and, I, you know, and it's, it's a wonderful place to work, and it's, a wonderful, it's wonderful work to do. But I will make a big pitch for jury service. If you get a jury su summons, don't be scared. Don't write a letter. Don't say, I don't want to drive downtown Akron. I don't know my way around. Come down. We're very welcoming. I'm the presiding judge. And I've been the presiding judge in 2013 and 2014. And one of the jobs I get is, I have is I, I get to rule on the request for jury excusal that people mail in early. So every day I get a, fo a blue folder and it has these things. My favorite one was last year a woman wrote and said, I am mother to 17 rescued parrots. And the parrots take an enormous amount of time in the morning, grooming, feeding, giving them medication. And then in the, uh, later in the day, and this is a huge responsibility, and these parrots are often ill. And here's the name of my avian vet and her phone number. And 
you can call to confirm because I have a lot of medical appointments for the parrots. And I was just like, okay, <laughs> you get to go. So I, I do uh, love, and the other job I have as the presiding judge is I help, I primarily, it's on me, select the grand jury. Now, if you get a, sir, a summons for grand jury, don't be scared. It's nine weeks, but it's very flexible. So we have lots of alternates, and it's from 8.30 in the morning until about 12.30, maybe Monday through Friday, no holidays. And we ha get so many alternates that we have actually have grand jurors. Like, they'll say, well, I have a one-week vacation planned you know, at week three, and then I'm gonna t we're going on a cruise at you know, week seven. <laughs> okay, that's okay, we'll fill it in. So don't be scared, come down. It's a great process. Jury service is um, truly akin to military service. When, when we always say to folks, you d it wasn't an engraved invitation that we sent you, it was a summons. We, it's a little bit like the draft, you gotta show up, and then we'll talk about it and see if you need, it doesn't work out for you. But I, I love my jurors, and I, it's, been the, it's been truly the best part of my job is meeting so many people um, in a positive way as jurors. And sometimes, obviously, you get called in on a pretty terrible case, and it's, it's heavy burden. Um, and we, we have resources for jurors who sit through those difficult trials through victims' assistance they can receive counseling. Because one of the things I, I often tell jurors is when you sit through the, one of those horrible murder trials or one of those child molesting trials or some terrible thing, you know, you're not allowed as a juror to talk about it, right? So you can't go home at night and talk to your spouse and your family or neighbors and say, oh, this is what I had to do. But what I tell the jurors is, even if you could talk about it, because I can talk about it, I'm allowed to go home and talk to my husband, he doesn't want to hear it. My mom doesn't want to. They, they go like this, stop, don't tell me this. So getting some professional help is often a good idea, because those folks are trained to be able to listen. They've seen the worst of the worst, and there's nothing you could say that will, you know, would turn them off. So we do have services for, for jurors, too. We're really a service-oriented place, and I want you all to come downtown. Yes, like the library. Business. Yeah. It is. Service That's it. And we can do that because people fill out evaluations. Uh, so if you could do that before we leave and go ahead with your question. Jody, how yes. I ask you, uh, I think, because... I've never served on a jury. <laughs> why is this room not packed with high school aged uh, parents? I invited and... counselors. I invited PTAs. I can't answer that question. Because I, this, this and room, it was in the paper. We've had uh, people come to see an author, and I remember the author came. Yes, we wrote, had his whole, a, both sides, 200 people. Yeah, with yes. that wrote a book on uh, rowing. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. That guy that came. It was packed with kids. Yeah. yeah. Those are the ones that should be hearing your message, Judge. Those yes. are the ones that, That's why however I this should be done, PTA. those are the ones yeah. should be Our, our board of education president is sitting over there taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is a pathetic turnout I because say us that. old folks that we, yeah. see this group? Nobody in here is a heroin addict, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> we all know each other. <laughs> 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 We all, one of the things that we all know people, we yes. all, we don't know we know them maybe, but we do know people yeah. who are struggling yeah. with heroin addiction. Yeah. We all know them. And there is this stigma, particularly in more prosperous communities. Everybody's kid has to be you know, doing the right thing, and it's a reflection on us as a parent if they're not doing the right thing. And so we do sometimes look the other way, and we don't want to, you know, oh my gosh, if I expose my kid for because he or she needs help, then the school's going to find out, and then th then one thing they're going to be treated differently, and how are they going to get into? You know, think about this. This is a community that worries about what preschool the kid's going to go to, right? Yes. I mean, there, I can tell you for a fact, because I sit on the board of Head Start, there is no finer preschool in America than Head Start because it's regulated so heavily by the government that there is one teacher for every very small number of students, one, you know, multiple aides. They have volunteer grandparent programs where all these folks come in and 
play grandparent to the kids, and it's, there's no finer preschool. But, you know, for, for, for those of us who can afford to send our children to preschool, we're all worried about what's the right one. Should it be Montessori? Should it be, you know, this? Should it be that? Should it be at the church? Should it be here or there? I mean, are you kidding me? We're worrying about that? So, but it's true. And, it, and you know, we're worrying about their college applications and all that kind of stuff. What school they're going to go to, what high school they're going to go to. And so we have a lot invested in our kids. And our kids, and oftentimes, and this is no criticism because I've been there too, we look, we think our kids are a reflection of us. And so we want to make sure that, you know, nobody thinks we're a bad mom or a bad dad. Um, so so I, I wonder how much of it may be that, well, this couldn't be my, this, this couldn't, this is one of those things I can check off because it's not in my family. Um, it wouldn't happen to my family. And um, that's what I, I fear. And it's why I come out and talk in communities like Hudson. This is, I went to the Rotary, too, um, and, had, and spoke to the Rotary about it as well. But I come out to communities because um, it, it is, it, 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 it has unified us in a tragic way, although the deaths occur in different ways across the board. I would maybe suggest you bring the judge in to the high school, maybe to health classes. We love field trips to the courthouse too. High school kids are good, you know, and, and we have some serious matters that go on, but, and it's not a scared straight kind of situation. It's just coming to see what we've got and how things are and what how people who come into our courthouse look just like us you know um, only they're often wearing orange jumpsuits but you know they they too went to Western Reserve Academy or Hoban or you know I just had one last question when you accept someone coming back from prison do you encourage them to go to the family home, or do you encourage no. them to go to a group home? I encourage them to go generally to a, what we call a halfway house. Yeah, because often their criminal behavior was going on when they were in that family home. So I'm not sending you back until we get the whole family. You know, a lot of times parents are enablers, or there's a sibling or someone who's an enabler or something, and we, we try to sort through that. It's, um, it's very seldom. We do have a lot of, I never have a problem getting anyone into a place. So, and then there's also, the other big component that we deal with in the courts, which is a topic for a whole other day, is the, the um, issue of mental illness in the community. You know, mental illness touches on every family, in every, in every walk of life, and often it results in criminal conduct as well. And so our jail and our prisons are full of people who are mentally ill who um, have committed crimes and we do have some resources here but we don't have enough so that's another ma major area and a lot of times they get dual diagnosis so maybe they'll have like depression and addiction and those are tough um, what is the penalty for heroin addiction well it, a, a, an F5, a felony five, which is the lowest level, level felony you could have for possession of a small amount of heroin, is 12 months maximum in prison. Um, all the way up to a second degree felony, and that would be a very serious trafficker, a seller, um, and that you could go to prison for up to eight years for that. So it's, it's a spread. Um, but usually big time traffickers, when they're arrested, often have guns. So that's a whole other charge. They have other types of they have, you know, they'll, they'll have multiple charges that, that can increase their prison sentence. And I will tell you that, you know, if you, the guys in the, folks in the jail, they make jail calls, you know, they get, they make collect calls out from the jail. And there is a sign above all the phones and it said, your call will be recorded. And when they're on the phone, they, the recording comes on all the time and says, this call is being recorded. This call is coming from the Summit County Jail. They don't, they don't care. They say the craziest things on these calls to their families. <laughs> and not only are they being recorded, but they're actually listening to them. And, the, you know, so, so when they have a court case and they come in and they'll say, well, you know, judge, it wasn't my 
Those, it wasn't my drugs, okay? I borrowed the car from my cousin and it wasn't my drugs. But then the prosecutor will say, well, I have a jail call where he's talking to his grandmother and he says it was his, okay? I'm just telling you. So, but we get these, you know, we, and so, but we hear all kinds of things and one of the things they talk about me is they'll say, oh, I got, I got Rollins. She's a program judge. And that's what they call Judge Stormer. I wear that with a badge of pride. She's a program judge. That means we try to put you in a program and try and fix you, you know? So they love me in they think that I'm a program judge until they come in and then they have no idea. I tell them I am your worst nightmare, you know, because I, I have expectations of you and I, and I want you to fulfill them. But one of the things I'll tell you is that very often, and I will tell you from the most privileged community to the least privileged community, very often I have found that over the last six years, I am one of the first people in these young people's lives who cares about them and has expectations of them. You know, we, I have a really good friend who's the head softball coach at Akron U, and she struggles with her players all the time on the girls' team because she said they're the privileged kids. They're always the star athlete. They're smart kids in school. You know, their parents are their best friends, you know, and they just they don't understand consequences. And so we work with those girls a fair amount because they're college kids and they get in a little trouble here and there and we're trying to help them learn some consequences. But I do have expectations and I tell them all the time, I'm 56 years old and I still want my dad to be proud of me. And you know, the worst thing my dad can say to me, as he has said, my dad's a tough guy, he has been wanting to say, is, oh, Mary Margaret, I'm disappointed. And I'm like, oh, dad, really? You know, he'll say like, you didn't call your mother. She went to the doctor last week and we were waiting for you to, she was waiting for you to call. I'm disappointed and you're like, oh, dad, I'm sorry. So I do want him to be proud of me, my parents to be proud of me and they have expectations and I try to live up to them. And I think that a lot of the people who come in front of me are just like that. They, they see me, they wanna be, they know I have expectations and I do care about many of them, not all of them. No, not all of them. Not the guys who come in and the you know wearing shorts and you know wacky clothes and stuff. I'm not always caring about those guys. But so, um, but I do encourage high school kids to come down and we can arrange things where they can sit in and sit in the jury box. So if it's a group of I have 14 seats in my jury box and um, we can bring in some high school students to come in or church groups. Sometimes youth groups are good. Um, there's just lots of opportunity and it's not. It's not about scared straight, and it's not about, look, this could happen to you. It's, a, it's just an interesting place. You know, we are, God bless America, you know, I am grateful that none of us like to pay taxes, but as someone whose salary comes from tax dollars, I'm very grateful for the situation. Yeah. So, so I, I think, you know, you own our courthouse. You know, and you pay my salary. So I think that it's helpful for us, our community, to come together and, and see what goes on down there. So I always invite folks to come down. Plus, I've become sort of a courthouse historian. I love the building, and I can take you on a tour. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for having me. Very, very much. Thanks to the management and staff of the Hudson Library and Historical Society for their assistance in the production of this program and for providing the important information for the citizens of Hudson. For a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this or any HCTV program, contact Hudson Cable Television at 330-653-2500 or via email at hctv at hudson.oh.us.